Um, so I'm going to be talking about package management using Python. Um, and the way that this talk is going to be sort of laid out, first I'm going to um, discuss a little bit of background information about prerequisites if you want to follow along. Um, I'm going to be demoing um, using uh, a Linux VM while we're going through. So you don't necessarily need to follow along, but if you want to. Um, if you have any questions about the setup or anything, just ask me and we'll go ahead and uh, try to answer those for you. Um, other things I'm going to talk about, just a general uh, discussion of what a package manager is, uh, what sort of input that entails. Uh, I'm going to discuss what PIP and virtual environment or virtual ENV are, um, what, they're, what they're supposed to do. I'm going to talk about how you actually use them, so actually working with them. Um, and then I'm going to go through sort of a real world example of using them, which is with the SC library project. Um, we've been using that to sort of keep track of project dependencies, and that's actually been working out really well for us. And then um, at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about distributing and sharing uh, your own packages using Python. Now, throughout today, I've been having issues actually logging into the service to do that, so the live demo is getting scratched. But um, I'm still going to go through the general process. Uh, so to begin the discussion of background info, um, the prerequisites aren't too bad. Uh, you need a version of Python, 2.7, 3x, whatever. Um, you need virtual environment, which um, if you install that, you'll also get PIP with that, um, although you can install them separately. Um, if you want to just Google for those, you can actually bring up the, uh, like on the websites, they will have instructions on how to install those. Now, um, because Python is a cross-platform uh, language, like is not specific to one particular platform. Uh, this will work on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS X. Uh, it'll work on pretty much anything that Python works on. Um, and I'll say up front that I have made a couple of assumptions with these slides. I do most of my Python development in Linux, so um, if you're using a different platform, your mileage may vary. Um, if you use Mac OS X, things should be similar-ish. I haven't actually done any Python development in Mac OS X, but from the tutorials I've looked at online, um, instead of using just a regular like Linux package manager, you use Homebrew or uh, Mac ports. But other than that, it's pretty close. If you use Windows, um, you can do it. I've actually set it up once, but I haven't personally used it beyond just simple toying around with things. Uh, it should work though. Fingers crossed. So um, to continue with that, uh, what exactly is a package manager? So the primary responsibility for a package manager is managing software packages. Well, duh. But what that actually entails can actually be a little bit involved, depending on sort of the scope of the package manager. Are you going for a single language, or are you going for an entire platform? It depends. So at its, you know, just, just to sort of get some definitions out there, a package is basically any software block, kind of. It can be an entire program, it can be a library, it can be a runtime environment, it can even be another package manager. Um, and with Arch Linux, I know in the past, like dealing with multiple package managers and stuff can be a little bit scary. Um, but you can do it. Um, there's two main sort of types of package managers. There's binary and source. And what's meant by that is, is your package basically a big old blob of binary executable code or are you just including the source for your application and then telling the system how to build it. Um, Arch uh, with Pac-Man uses the uh, source style. In fact a lot of BSD or uh, BSD uses that and Arch's, Arch's uh, package management system is sort of styled after that. Um, things like Ubuntu and Fedora are more styled after having a binary that you actually download with a package manager. Um, some things that a package manager is supposed to do, at the bare minimum, it should download and install a package. That's sort of the main number one feature. But other package managers can do things like check if a package is up to date. It can search for a package from there so you don't actually have to pull up a website. Um, it can automatically download and install dependencies for you. Uh, you can use it to uninstall a package, or you can even switch from one package version to another 
you can roll back to a different package if the most recent one breaks. So some examples of different package managers, if you have used, or how many people here use Linux? So basically everyone, that's good. Um, so with Linux, um, most people tend to stick with like Ubuntu or Fedora. They're a little bit more, I guess, easier distros. Um, but examples of packet managers on those platforms include things like apt or yum, or even things like as uh, sort of uh, far away from that as like the Ubuntu app store, uh, which I believe is actually built on top of either apt or aptitude or one of those other projects. So under the hood, that is using a uh, package management system. It's just you, you have a nice GUI to sort of uh, look at things through. On Windows, um, there's a couple of projects. There's one called Nougat. There's another one called Chocolatey. Chocolatey is actually built on top of Nougat. Uh, and what those allow you to do, um, Nougat is more uh, targeted at um, development, so more like software libraries and stuff. Chocolatey is more targeted at actual, like, full-on applications, so it's more of a proper package manager. Um, Homebrew and Mac ports are available for OS X, and then on BSD-derived systems, there's things like the ports collection, which those vary so much between systems that it's kind of hard to describe, but at the, you know, the, the basic idea is you're compiling and sort of merging the source code you compile into your uh, kernel. So to actually start talking about uh, PIP and virtual environment and what those are, um, to begin, uh, I'll talk with about PIP. So PIP is a package manager for Python. Um, it's targeted at developers. Uh, most of the library or most of the packages there are libraries and frameworks. Um, there is a limited selection of like full software you can download. Um, when I was looking through the package list earlier, there's even some uh, packages targeted at like different languages like Assembly or Java. Um, but for the most part, it's things like Django or um, uh, Flask or Bottle, different development libraries, or Pygame. And PIP packages its, um, or it sources its packages from a couple of locations. You can go through um, what's called PyPy, um, which is basically a list, or like an index, with um, a whole bunch of packages listed and download locations. So you can tell uh, PIP, I want to download this package, and it'll do all the grunt work of figuring out how to download and install that for you. You can also point it at a version control system. So for example, you can point it at a GitHub page, and it's smart enough to know so long as there's like a setup.py file in the repo, oh, I can install this, and I can treat it like a package. Um, same thing even if you have like a project that you have downloaded and extracted into a directory, you can do that too. You can point PIP at it and say, install this and treat it like a package, and it will do it. Um, if anyone has used Rails, which I know a couple of people here have, um, this setup is sort of similar to Gem and Bundler, or if you've used Node, um, I know there's at least one person in here who has, uh, it's similar to like Node Package Manager. <coughs> So in terms of actually installing a package, uh, it's really easy. Once you have PIP installed, you just type in PIP install and then the package name. Um, it's very simple. And what it will do is it will install to a couple of possible locations. Um, by default, it'll put it in um, the site packages folder for your distro if you're using Linux or Mac OS. Um, if you're using Windows, it'll put it in its own little directory right here. Um, and just a hint at where we're going to be going with this talk, you can possibly put it somewhere else. I'll, I'll, I'll be a little bit tight-lipped about that one, but we'll get there. Um, and uh, you can also sort of handle dependencies with this. Um, it's not exactly the most beautiful way of doing it. Pretty much you just group a whole bunch of packages under what's called a collection. So say you want to download Flask, which is just as some background info, is more of just a generic um, web framework. It's not like Django, which is targeted at CMS type work. Um, what you can do is you say, OK, so this package is Flask. It contains two or three different other packages that all have to be installed at the same time. And those are all grouped together. When you say PIP install Flask, it'll download all three of those packages and install them. 
Uh, installing a specific package version is possible as well. Um, you literally just tack on an equals equals and then the version number you want. Um, and everything else from before applies here too. Um, if you want to install a list of packages, you can do that by putting all those packages, along with version numbers if you want, on a uh, you know one one line or one um, one name per line in a file, and then you can pass that using the R flag to PIP, and it'll install them. Um, this is handy because suppose you want someone else to be able to install a whole bunch of packages as part of your project, you can just have them install this, uh, or you can have PIP install the requirements for you from one file, and then they don't even really have to do much typing to get up and running. They literally just pass the file to PIP and it does all the work for you. Um, this is a good point to take a break and jump into the VM. Okay, so um, I've gone ahead and set up just a very bare bones VM uh, with PIP and virtual environment on it. So if I want to go ahead and install a package, let's say we want to put Django in here. It'll go ahead and start doing that for us. Uh, really easy, instead of having to go through and like download this from the Django website and manually either build it from source using configure or a whole bunch of other weird, strange, difficult things, or manually drag it into your Python site packages folder, you literally just tell PIP to go at it and it will do all that work for you. So um, we have Django installed. And we can actually go ahead and uh, start using Django if we want. Yeah, okay. Django project in there. Yep. So now we have a stock Django application in there, and literally in like two minutes, we have a working Django environment. Um, you can then start tweaking on things, working on the project to your heart's content. Instead of having to do a whole bunch of ugly configuration stuff that normally would have taken a while. Um, so. Uh, Just to show you an example of the requirements.txt file, this is what we've got going for the library project. So we have two requirements right now, which is Django and another application called South, or another uh, library called South. And literally, that's all those two. That's all that's in that text file. It's just two lines that say, here's the package we want, here's the version number we want for it. And what you can do then is. Uh, <coughs> I'll get back to that. <clears throat> so um, another thing you can do, suppose you've been working on a project for a bit and you know you now have a bunch of dependencies for it, um, but you don't know off the top of your head what exactly those are. Because it's been a while, you've just been sort of throwing requirements in there as you've been going. One thing you can do is you can type in PIP freeze and that will tell you all of the dependencies for the project that you have in your current Python site packages, um, which is where PIP will install by default. Um, and while this is a solution, it's kind of kludgy. It'll list every package that you install, not necessarily the ones you're using. So in that sense, it's sort of a dumb brute force approach. But um, if you can go through and manually trim this down, then you can have a uh, requirements.txt file which you can include with your project, and then um, that makes distribution a little bit easier. Um, another thing you can do is you can upgrade a package. So by default, um, if you type in PIP install, it will, and then a package name, it will check to see if the package is installed, but it won't update it for you. Um, you have to explicitly tell it to upgrade packages. Justification for that being, if a package upgrade happens, 
um, that could possibly break your application. I mean, that has happened with Django in the, in the past, where they'll make a change into the hood which possibly can break things. Um, so this is one way of just sort of having a little bit more fine-grained fine control over what you have installed for your project. And what that command actually will do is it'll pull down the latest version. Uh, that in combination with being able to target a specific version is very powerful. Um, along those lines, you can uninstall a package as well. I um, honestly can't think of a time where I've needed to do this, um, but you can do it. Um, so again, just to sort of uh, demo those features. Um, so right now, we should only have Django in this project, because that's the only, or sorry, this, um, on this machine, only Django and maybe Flask should be installed because I believe I was using that. Right. So let's see. Okay, so we've got Flask, we've got some of its dependencies, and we also have Bottle. So there are a couple more things in there. This is basically everything that I've ever had to either explicitly install or as part of a package install in um, this particular community. I'll go ahead and scroll that up because these people are having trouble seeing that. Is that good, by the way? Can everybody see above here? Or, good. Okay. So yeah. Um, and then you can go ahead and pipe that to a file. And now we have a requirements.txt file that we can distribute with our project. And then everybody else can install this. So, um, tools are handy, but we don't exactly need them right now. Uh, spoilers. Okay. So, why should we use PIP in place of just another package manager? Um, I mean, hypothetically, you could go ahead and use whatever package manager to include with your Linux distro. You could use Mac ports. You could use a Windows installer. And, I mean, this is another step. Why, you, why do you want to do this? Why do you care? Um, well, from what I've noticed, just working with this for a bit, um, OS package managers typically don't have the same breadth of packages as PIP. PIP is sort of like a, uh, it's something that the Python community uses a lot. So if there's a package out there, people are probably going, or if somebody's working on a package, they're probably going to put it on PIP, or PyPy rather, sorry. Um, and using uh, PIP, you can pretty much install most of the Python packages that you could ever think that you need. And even if there's one that isn't quite on um, PyPy yet, because you can install from GitHub and treat that like a package, um, you can you have access to even stuff that's not even in a package yet. Um, other things that are worth noting, OS package managers aren't always up to date. So um, for a while, um, when uh, Django 1.4 came out, for I think a good solid two or three weeks, Ubuntu was still stuck at like 1.3 or something like that. Other things that are worth noting, um, system specific updates may actually break libraries and having that managed by a separate package manager instead of your OS one can help sort of prevent that if you just overlook your um, OS package manager install. Um, Again, installing packages from VCS is a really handy feature, especially if you like to dabble around with new libraries as they come out. Um, and I'd say this one's kind of arguable, depends, but I'd say PIP is actually really much easier to use than a lot of the operating system package managers. It's really just a matter of doing PIP install or PIP uninstall instead of a whole string of ugly, like, pseudo apt get install, blah, 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 blah. <coughs> Um, there are still some disadvantages with this though. Um, because PIP isn't hooked in with the OS as much, um, some dependencies just can't be handled. For example, if you want to install Pygame, you need to still manually install SDL on your own. Um, you can still use the OS package manager in addition to PyPy or PIP. Um, and failing that, like you could still compile from source, but that's still kind of icky. Um, the package, like listing dependencies, uh, that's a little bit kludgy. 
um, and reproducing your setup, even with that capability, can be a little bit difficult because you have to go back through there and manually sort of adjust your file, your requirements.txt file. And one thing that is kind of a big um, sort of uh, missing point from PIP is that it doesn't really handle package conflicts. And I've never encountered this, but hypothetically, if one project uses a namespace and another project happens to use that name, same namespace, there's going to be a conflict there. And PIP, in and of itself, just doesn't know that there would be an issue there. At least from what I gather, I've, I've done a bit of searching on this one and I couldn't find any information about this. So I, I believe they don't handle it. Um, one way to work around some of these issues is to use virtual environment. So virtual environment, and this is going to be another callback to the uh, Rails community, but if you use anything like RVENV or RVM, virtual environment is similar to that. The idea is you can kind of create arbitrary Python virtual environments, which you can just sort of treat as its own little sandbox. Um, and what this will do when you set up a virtual environment, it will set up its own Python environment for you. Literally, it'll set up its own Python interpreter, separate from your systems one. Um, <clears throat> by default, the only thing that these environments will have are things like setup tools, which is something I think PIP uses under the hood, and PIP. So you get a very clean, <coughs> very clean uh, Python setup that's totally separate from whatever your base system is. Um, and the nice thing about this is, suppose that for one project, you want to be doing game development. Or, and then at the same time, you also have to do web development. But you still want to be able to sort of curate which dependencies you have using PIP. Well, you can do that. It's really easy. You just set up a virtual environment for your game development and one for web development. You can just sort of partition those off from each other entirely. Um, and how this actually works is under the hood, um, it'll temporarily override your shell's um, path variable for Python. So you, you can totally bust your Python setup. So long as you're in a virtual environment, like you can do horrible things to it. So long as you're in a virtual environment, it doesn't matter. You can just delete the virtual environment, you're good. So in terms of actually creating a virtual environment, uh, you run virtual environment and then you give it a directory. It's that easy. Um, Usually, I put these in a hidden directory in my home folder. That's just personal preference. You can put it anywhere. Um, you can include it with project. That way you know which, if you want to do um, project-specific virtual environments, it's just a nice way of mapping the two. Um, however, just this step alone isn't enough to get you running. This just creates it for you. It doesn't actually set it up for you. So you're still using your system Python directory at this point. Enabling it is really, really easy too. You just type in source and then you point to that bash script, which is located in the virtual environment. Um, and again, what that's doing is it's just overriding some bash, or in the case of Linux anyway, it's overriding bash shell variables to work. So um, going back to our VM over here, uh, you may have noticed this little bit right here. Well, this whole time I've been in a virtual environment. So what I can do is I can say, which Python? I'm using the Python interpreter located there. That's a system <coughs> Python interpreter. So this entire time, it's sort of been operating off of totally different Python versions. Um, and what I can do is I can break out of here. And I can even create another one, which will be there. And it goes ahead and installs setup tools for you, it installs PIP. Um, we can go ahead and I think, yeah, so install it in the current directory. Um, I'll go ahead and activate that. And you'll notice over here, we're now in a separate virtual environment. Can you guys actually see that? I know it's a little bit tough with the black on white. Um, yeah? Can you load a virtual environment in your virtual environment? I've never actually tried it. Let's find out. <laughs> okay, we do have the command. Do it. Do it. <laughs> Turns out you can. And if you go back to the other one, do you get kicked back up? 
Okay, so yeah, that one's an inception, and then we deactivate it. You don't get kicked. It just overrides your prior. You didn't get kicked back yeah, out. Yeah, so it just, it just kicks you out of all of them. Oh. So you can't keep on jumping back and forth between these. It's kind of a <laughs> silly and contrived example there, but hey, you can do it. Uh, is there a way to just run a program in the virtual environment without having to like, activate and deactivate, just say, oh, I'll use this for this one run? I have seen um, some ZSH shell scripts where as soon as you CD into a project directory, it'll activate that for you just implicitly. Uh, I'm, is that the question? Is that what you wanted? Or is that the answer? Or? Can I, kind of, I just want to do like a, a one shot and I say, well, I want to just try it in this environment without having to like activate or deactivate it. Just sort of do a one. There's another project called Virtual Environment Wrapper, which sounds like what you want. Okay. What you can do is you can just um, you can create you create it the same way as you do with this, but then you can just do something, I think it's virtual environment start, and then you give it the name of the one you want, and then you're just there, instead of having to do manual directory stuff. Okay, cool. Any other questions, or? Okay, I'm gonna keep on moving. So um, I'm gonna talk uh, about um, our experiences using PIP and uh, virtual environment in the SSE library project. So one of the things back when we were starting out with the project that we wanted to have was a really easy install script because we were concerned that freshmen who hadn't actually worked with or had no shell scripting experience would be kind of intimidated by having to type in a whole bunch of scary kind of uh, you know, commands to actually install the thing just to get the thing up and running at first. So one way that we approached this was using the uh, requirements.txt file. Um, from our install script, we, we have our requirements.txt file in source control. And from our um, install script, which um, we set it up so that you can go ahead and just straight up um, from our git page for the project. Uh, as soon as he gets to the readme, I'll show you. So we have a command right here, or right here, which will go ahead and first off, it'll curl the install script, and then it'll run it. And our install script, first off, it checks to see if you actually have PIP installed, and if not, it will attempt to install it. Um, otherwise, what it does is first it clones out our project. Uh, actually, sorry. First, it actually installs all the prerequisites for the project. Then it does a git clone, sets up a virtual environment, uh, activates it. Sorry, I made a mistake. The um, PIP install happens down here. This is just setting the command for it. But um, that's to get around um, different distros when you're um, using PIP. Unfortunately, they've all got different names for the actual PIP command because apparently there's a curl package manager, which is also called PIP. Um, so, like for example, Arch will call it like PIP Python, and then Fedora calls it like Python PIP2 or something like that. It's kind of ridiculous. But um, to get back on point, basically what our install script does is it clones out the repository, um, creates a virtual environment for that project and then installs all the prerequisites, and then you're ready to go. Um, if you want, then you can just start working on the project. Um, that's in place of doing all that by hand and manually setting up, uh, downloading the requirements, or sorry, the um, prerequisites, manually installing them in the site packages folder. It just makes it a lot easier to, work, to start working on the project. Makes it a bit less intimidating. Um, that's entirely not the page I meant to go to. And yeah, right there. Um, PIP just makes dependency management just effortlessly simple. Um, yeah. So another area that was kind of a little bit weird to work with at first was setting up a continuous integration service for a project. Um, we, from the get-go, were um, 
we wanted testing. And we actually found a service that's called Travis CI that you point at a GitHub repo, and as soon as you push a commit to it, it will do a build. And um, I guess just as a quick primer for anyone who hasn't done continuous integration in the past, basically what it means is that you have very, very frequent builds, um, either at some set interval, so every hour um, at a past co-op, it was once a day at least, and whenever a commit was made to the sort of main code repository. Um, but getting back to the point, with Travis CI, what it will do for Python projects is internally it uses uh, PIP. Um, in a config file, you tell it where your requirements.txt file is. And when it's doing a build, it will do the full like pulling down your requirements, and then it'll run your project's unit tests for you. So if we go to the actual page for this, We can see right here that it goes ahead and grabs Django, grabs South, and then it actually starts running some tests after everything's all installed and ready to go. So it just makes um, managing dependencies in that context a lot easier. Um, we actually found out about that particular um, service after we had kind of decided on PIP. And the moment we saw it was integrated in there, I was like, oh, that's really handy. Um, in terms of applying this to your own projects, um, I know that a lot of the freshmen next quarter are going to have a Python project that uses either Piglet or Pygame, um, one of those two. Uh, I believe both of those libraries are on virtual environment, or PIP, rather. Um, so what you can do, if you want, don't want to dirty up your Python site packages directory with like a single inst or a single library just for that one project, or if you want to kind of keep like a um, sort of level playing field between all your team members, just that they all have a consistent environment to work with, um, maybe this will work for you. Maybe you can go ahead and set up a requirements.txt file in your SVN repo or CVS, one of those two, I don't remember which. Um, and then you can go ahead and use that so that your installs are really, really easy when you're setting up your project. Yeah. So submitting packages to the PyPy index. Um, this is really easy too, uh, although it seems like their uptime, at least today, was a little bit spotty. Um, I'll say up front, it could be user error. Um, my, it uses OpenID, and there was some weirdness with regards to that uh, for using a Google account. But if you want to try that, you can. If you can get that working, you're golden. Otherwise, you can just register an account for it. But the process for this is simple. You register an account there, or you use your OpenID um, authentication to do that. Um, you go ahead and clean up your app and make sure that, it, or your, um, your app or library or whatever clean it up so that it's ready for submission. Um, and just as a note, um, things you'll want to do during that step is remove any private keys or any kind of like API keys you've got stored in your project. For library, we actually left a uh, credential like that in our settings file that we accidentally committed. So we had to go back there and clean that up. It wasn't that important because we aren't actually using this in a live system. But little things like that, you'll want to actually check first before you commit. Um, and especially before you start sharing this with everyone out there on the internet. Um, one of the prerequisites for actually submitting a uh, project is having dist, util dist utils installed. So make sure that's installed. You can install it via uh, PIP, or PIP if you want. Um, from there, you write a setup.py file which just contains, it's a, um, uh, like a list list of strings basically with a whole bunch of information about who you are, um, account credentials, no password or anything like that, just a username. Um, and then you go ahead and write a PyR IRC file which contains information about whether this is a project that source code is on GitHub or it's stored in a repository of some sort or if it's going to be on uh, PyPy servers. And then you just run python setup.py register. And uh, from there, everything else is pretty much automated. It'll ask you for credentials, 
you grow up. You supply them, and then literally it'll package up your project for you and upload that to the site. So it's submitting code is really easy for that. And uh, from there, that's the last of the content I was going to cover. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. So is PyPy a standard for Python as like Bumbler is for Ruby, or are they like because PyPy seems to, like have a different focus? Like <coughs> Bumbler's entirely focused around like gem files and stuff like that. PyPy seems more like it'll install stuff on your system for you more. Um, I'll say up front, I'm not as familiar with outside like community stuff beyond the Python community, so I'm not sure if there's like necessarily a direct analogy, but. Um, from what I gather online, Py, uh, PyPy is sort of like a very large community in terms of like the in, in terms of the grander scheme of the Python community. They're one of the bigger ones. I'm sorry, that's not fully answering your question. Is PyPy like it? Like, if I'm gonna start like uh, some web app and I'm gonna manage my packages, is like PyPy the only choice, pretty much? Or um, a lot of people do it through um, Git as well. Like they'll um, just straight up. Okay. use GitHub for it. That, that, that was what a lot of people out there were suggesting as an alternative. For their binaries? Uh, for Python? For... Yeah. Or um, like large library. Okay. For Python binaries, it seems like most projects are distributed just with source or they're distributed what's called like an egg, like a Python egg, which I can't really give you too many details about because honestly I don't know. Okay. Um, I know that's one other popular distribution format. <laughs> So, in the past, I've used something called Easy Install, and so what is the difference between that and? So, Easy Install, from uh, what I gather, just handles pretty much setting up a, uh, a library, and with that, um, I think that one also will go against um, the PyPy library, but I don't think it's quite as um, it doesn't provide as much utility. Like you can't. Um, you can't, like, say, for example, pass in a file with dependencies in it. Um, I think it's mostly just a uh, functionality difference. The thing that's funny on Windows is, in order to install pip on Windows, you need to install it easy, pip. easy yeah. install, and then install pip. So mm -hmm. you need a package manager with a package manager. Lulz. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, you can also get around that by just straight up installing virtual environment, because virtual environment will, environment or virtual env will include pip with it. But you can't get through. Get, you can't get those things without having a package manager to begin with. Um, I know the virtual environment people do <coughs> include a um, setup.py file, which you can run so long as I think you have a dist utils installed. I want to say, so long as you've got that installed, then you can run there. Their setup thing. Other questions or? Okay, so that seems like that's it. Um, I didn't put my email up here, but if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, that's pretty much it.